Pleasure shaking my head. <laughs> Father, we're glad to be here. We thank you for your presence, for your blessings, for the meal that we shared, and for you watching over those that you love. We especially pray for Lori Anderson, that you would be with her and bless her after she, as she recovers from her surgery and help her with her issues concerning her blood pressure. And bless all those who are struggling with health issues. And be with Sandy till she has her surgery in a couple of weeks. Continue to sustain her as she waits for that great day. Father, bless our time and our study together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we are uh, going to finish the Holy Spirit part one. Now we have been looking at who the Spirit, Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. We're going to finish this lesson and move into the second lesson tonight, which is who is the devil and what does he do? Okay, so that's, that's the second part of this. So we're back to what does the Holy Spirit do? And it's ironic that as I'm working for, working ahead to get ready for Sunday mornings, I'm working on Galatians, which is a perfect book to follow up Romans. Because we're, we're getting close to finishing Romans on Sunday morning. And I was doing Galatians 5 today. So this passage I just went through. Okay? So, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Uh, what is the difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit? Do you know? Any, any thoughts? Uh, the gift, the gifts are from God. Well, so and, are the. And, well, and as we use those gifts, then we reap the um, shoot, the, words, the fruits. Okay. And, uh, and I think the fruit is the visible sign. Signs. In us. Okay, let me read this passage to you. Now there are ver there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another effect, effecting, the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But the one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Not everybody gets all the gifts. The gifts are given according to how the Spirit wants to use a person in the ministry of the gospel in the world. Okay? So typically, we think of preachers having the gift of prophecy, which is the gift of proclaiming the Word of God. Prophecy has two meanings. Telling, foretelling through the Word of God, like giving prophecies about the future, and telling forth the Word of God, which is proclaiming the Word of God, preaching it. So you want your preacher to have the gift of prophecy, the ability to communicate the Word of God effectively in a group setting. Okay, Not every person gets gifts. The same gift. Every Christian gets the fruit of the Spirit. All the fruit, all nine that are listed. Every Christian gets those because that's a manifestation of the Spirit's presence in your life. It's a manifestation of what it means to have faith in Christ as your Savior, to be a child of God. I and mean, look, look at the list. Love. That's agape love. That is the kind of love that says, I will love you regardless. Remember, there's four different kinds of Greek love in the Greek language. There's one that's not found in the Bible, okay, which is storge, the, the love that an animal animals have, like a wolf or her pups. Okay? Then there's... Uh, Philos, which is, the, which is love and affection for someone who's close to you, like a friend. I, I love my best friend, I'll die for my best friend, but I won't die for you because you're not my friend. There's uh, eros, which we learned the word erotic, that's the root word for erotic, which is a passionate, sexual, sensual love that's very easily perverted. It's wholesome within marriage, but perverted in the world. And then there's agape love, which an unbeliever cannot even understand. It's the kind of love that says, I'll love you if you love me. I'll love you if you hate me. I'll die for you if, my, if you're my friend, and I'll die for you if you're my enemy. It is only as a person experiences agape love from God 
that they can have it for other people. And it's one of the fruit of the Spirit that you, as a child of God, have been given the ability to love other people selflessly as Christ does. So we've been given the ability, but... You, the fruit's here. How, how is it going to be, Are you allowing it to be manifested in right. your life? Yes. Right. You still have the struggle with the flesh. Yeah. Okay? But every Christian is, is to have the fruit of the Spirit. It's not like the gifts. You only get some. Every Christian has all the fruits of the Spirit available to them because the Spirit is present in your life. The second one, uh, joy. Not the giggly, funny, you know, times are fun, we're on a, at a carnival kind of joy, but it's that deep-seated sense of contentment and joy that you have in your life where you're at peace. And that's part of the whole process. Peace is the next one. Peace is a peace that's not determined by circumstances in your life. It's an inner peace that the world can be falling apart around, around you, but you have a confidence in your spirit, in who you are. You're at peace inside. That's the peace that God gives, okay? Um, patience. Enough said, right? <laughs> That's one of the hardest ones, to have patience. Uh, uh, is that a struggle? How is that a struggle for you? That remark. Uh, <laughs> kindness. Uh, the, the genuine desire to do good things for people, to bless other people. Uh, goodness, kind of the same thing. That you, that you desire and gravitate toward things that are good as opposed to things that are evil. That you, that you treasure things that are of a good nature. Faithfulness, which is an interesting one. It's not that only you're being faithful to God as a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, but people know you as someone who's faithful, as a sense of integrity and your word is your bond kind of thing. <clears throat> you know, Christian character is tied into faithfulness. Okay? Uh, gentleness. We gotta work on that one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You are pretty good. Cool. <laughs> Self control. Thank you, God. No, I'm also this. Self control. No, that you are mastering your own body. Too late. That you have the ability to control your actions and reactions. Okay? Now, now granted. These are fruit of the Spirit, and as you grow and mature in your faith, as your faith grows stronger, these fruit are more manifest. Okay? But every Christian gets all the fruit. How much you make use of those, how visible they are active in your life, depends on your growth in Christ, your maturity, your, your, your desire to be close to God. Okay? Against those things, there is no law. The law, be it the the moral law condemns sin. There's no law against these things. Paul's just being saying, frankly, against things like this, there is no law. There's, nobody's going to object if you're patient. Nobody's going to object if you're kind and gentle. Those are things that, that people in the world rarely see. Okay? And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. How does that tie into it? Because if I'm following my passions and my desires, like my flesh guide my life, I'm not going to have any of those. But if I am submitting myself to Christ, like the Galatians passage, 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Then, as I live, these things become evident in my life. Because I'm not living by my guidelines and rules. I'm living according to Christ. So, uh, the Holy Spirit gives to each Christian the ability to bear fruit for their Savior. So what does the Spirit do? He brings you the gifts of the Spirit by His presence. That's one of the greatest things we have. That's what sets us apart. I mean, all you have to do is go shopping at Walmart or H-E-B. Let's say about two days before Thanksgiving or a couple days before Christmas when it's crowded and everybody's stressed and anxious and you can barely make it through the aisles, you, if you're walking down the aisle and you're pacing and you're smiling at people and you're engaging people, you stand out. Yes. Drastic. They say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> okay, that's, that's where you see it quickly, man. And in the opposite to people that are frustrated and angry and anxious and everything else. Okay? So here's another one. So that was the last of what does the Holy Spirit do? That's what... Hmm? Is it safe to say that 
to use this, the the gifts of the Spirit with the fruit of the Spirit, you're more effective as a Christian? Absolutely. I mean, I mean think, think, of, think of the gift of prophecy and preaching. Um, right. You know, a pastor can be good at preaching the Word and teaching the Word, but if he's an absolute jerk in his relationship with people, it's not going to go very far. Yeah, I met one of them. You met one of them? <laughs> but if, if the fruits of the Spirit are manifest in his life and, and the way he engages and deals with people, then the preaching becomes more effective because you can turn people off by your actions and your attitude and drive them away even though you're preaching the truth. Right. So it works that way with any of the gifts. Yes, ma'am? You're looking at me like... You're one to talk. <laughs> you know that look? I do know that look. Okay, so what does the Holy Spirit do? We transition now uh, to the next section. How can we be sure we are converted? How do you know you're a Christian? Hmm. I believe and who Jesus is and what he did on the cross as my Savior and I trust in the blood that he shed. I believe that. Does that make me a Christian? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's faith and nothing else. But the Spirit is the one who is in charge of that. Now Jesus had many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. What is John telling us at the end of his Gospel? We don't have everything. We don't have every miracle recorded. We don't have every teaching recorded. We don't have you know, everything given to us. It would be impossible. Because John before this, I believe, says that... If everything that Jesus did and said was recorded, the world would not contain the volumes of books that would be written. Yeah. Okay. We have what God determined we need. And what's the purpose of what we've been given? Believe who Jesus is, the Christ, the Son of God, and what He did. Okay. Um, it's no good to believe in Jesus who was just a man. If He's not the Son of God, He's not the Savior. You know, there's one correct understanding of who Jesus is. That's why the creeds are important. Be it the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian <coughs> Creed. Uh, that's why the creeds are important because the church has defined how we understand the deity of Jesus. Because all the creeds are written about the deity of Jesus. Because that's what was attacked. Okay? The Apostles' Creed, one of the oldest creeds. Okay? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Boom. To talk about God the Father's done. Okay? Uh, and what's the third article? How does it start? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the whole Christian church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of life, and the body and life everlasting. Boom, the third article's done. For the second article, and I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. Amazing memory. Okay. Uh, a long second article about Jesus because that's what was being attacked. Because what were they saying? Jesus wasn't God. <clears throat> Jesus was just a man. The spirit of the second person of the Trinity, the spirit of the Son of God, descended upon a man when he was baptized. And when he went to the cross, the spirit left and just a man died on the cross. That was the heresy going around. And so they wrote a creed to say, no, this is who Jesus is. And you get to the, the Athanasian Creed, or the Nicene Creed in 325, you know, he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being in one substance with the Father, doom, doom, all these repetitive statements, because we're clarifying what? Jesus is the God who was in heaven, who became a human being, and lived as, a, for, as we do, died for us, and rose again, and ascended to heaven. They're being very particularly clear, because that's what was attacked. What, is, what does John say? We have to believe that he is the Son of God. The deity of Christ is the most attacked doctrine in the world. Because if he's not who he says he is, he's nobody. And if you don't believe in him as he's revealed himself, you're not a Christian. What was the third creed you said, Pastor? Athanasian creed. That's the two week long creed. Yeah, that's, you know, it's long. If I, 
on, on the uh, set on the second creed you mentioned. The yeah, Nicene? Nicene Creed. You know, when it comes down to very God, very God, begotten, I'm made being of one substance. Right. That this is what separates Jesus from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because he's equal and one made of, he's equal with the Father, made the Father, there's no separation. Right. There's no separation from the Holy Spirit either. And I but that's what that's what everybody gets wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what's always attacked. That's why we say there's not three people in the Trinity. Because it's not three people. It's three persons is the way we say it. And I think it, that that's the beautiful thing. Of, Luther did a really good job in, the, in his catechism of his explanations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It really clarifies. To understand the creed itself. Yes. So, what the Holy Spirit revealed through the inspiration of Holy Scripture is what is necessary for our salvation. If you believe what the Bible says about Jesus, if you believe it, that's all you need. You don't need anything else. There's so many people today who says, yeah, we got the Bible, but I want to hear from God directly. Good luck. <laughs> Not going to happen. Look around. And God has revealed. Might be hearing from Him directly. Yeah. <laughs> if we believe what is revealed in God's Word concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then we have eternal life. It's not how you feel. Let's get that straight. Because your flesh can be deceptive. Sometimes I feel like a scumbag. Sometimes I feel like I don't deserve squat. Sometimes I feel like I deserve to go to hell. That's how I feel. Yeah. My feelings don't matter. Because our salvation is not a subjective. Today I feel saved and I'm saved and tomorrow I don't feel saved so I'm not saved. It's not subjective. It's not about how I feel. It's an objective reality. God has declared it and God has made it so through the working of the Spirit when He worked faith in our heart. It's not about what I've done. It's about what God's done. Salvation is the work of God from beginning to end, from eternity to the cross to my heart. It's about what God has done, not what we have done. See, you might not always feel it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It's kind of like baptism. Um, it's an objective thing. You got water poured on you. You got the name of God spoken over you. You didn't do it to yourself. It was done to you from outside yourself. And that's why you can always look back to your baptism and say, I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God put his name upon me. It's about what he's done, not about how I feel. Because it's an objective reality, I can trust in it. If it was subjective about how I feel, I'd walk out the door now because, I don't know, I've got to play this game. But it's not about how we feel. It's about what God's done. Okay? All right. Uh, I can be sure we're converted. Acts. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, What? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What's required? Believe. Faith. Believe. Faith. Nothing else. Okay? Uh, Pastor Russ, if, if I may, on that bottom verse, mm -hmm. I've been asked a lot of people saying that I'm a believer, I've been baptized. But I don't have to worry about my son being a believer because it says that because I believe my household is saved. No, nope. not what it says. It's like in Acts two thirty eight: repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will be saved. This is for you and your whole household, and all who are far off will believe. Is Paul saying in Acts two, you get saved and your household saved? No, that is heretical teaching. That came about, when did it come out? After the Reformation, for sure. Uh, when, when they were struggling with, when some were struggling with him at baptism. Because they wanted to deny the fact that a child can be sinful. And they, because they got confused with all kinds of things. So let's, let's play the devil's advocate for a second. Is a child sinful? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Has a child done anything sinful? Yes. yes. No. 
Yes. He hasn't slapped his mama. He hasn't, you know, like cursed her out or anything. He hasn't done anything. He's sinful by nature. He's corrupted because of the sin of humanity, the fall of Adam and Eve. If that were not true, babies would not die. Because death is the result of sinfulness, of the reality of sin. If there's no sin, if someone is holy, there'd be no death. Babies die. Sad. We're born corrupted. That corruption is, is a separation from God, a reality of a separation from God, just as much as as I grow older and I make a choice to sin, I steal, I lie, I slap my mama. Those sins, be careful, Sandy, those sins <laughs> are, are sins of action that also reveal that I'm separate from God and deserving of judgment and damnation. So you have original sin and actual sin. Both damn you to hell. So what has God done? He's provided the way by which He can deal with our sin regardless of age because faith is not a matter of the intellect. John the Baptist leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when Jesus drew near, when he heard her voice. Faith is a matter of the working of God, the Holy Spirit, in connection with the spirit of a person, not the mind of a person. If it only has to do with the mind of a person, a small child could never be saved. A severely mentally retarded person could never be saved. Someone who had a brain injury could never be saved. It's not a matter of the intellect. It's a matter of the spirit. The shorthand is heart. We say, you know, faith is born in the heart. Well, technically, no. Faith is born when the spirit is reborn. And so, uh, it's not about... And so what happened, back to your question... After the Reformation, there was a group of people that began to question. And they were the, the actually the forefathers, the Puritans, basically, that children can't do anything wrong. Uh, they need to reach an age of accountability. That's when baptism ought to happen. And children are saved under the covenant of their parents until they reach that age. Show me in the Bible where there's an age of accountability. It does not exist. It's a man-made idea, not even a doctrine. We are sinful from the get-go. I guarantee you, you got a two-year-old, you got to teach them to be bad. you got to teach them to be good because at two years old, they're already being bad. you got to teach them for six months. What are yeah. you talking about? So, <laughs> being bad comes by nature. Being good is instilled. And, and with direction and the work of God and godly parents, a child learns to be good. There is no such thing as an age of innocence or a, someone in a household protected because they're part of that household until they get old enough. That's a heretical teaching. came about in the 1600s. If, if, that, if that were true, then God would be wrong for what He did in the Old Testament by killing the firstborn of, of Egypt. Or okay. all the times that Israel is commanded to go in and annihilate the nations. Yeah. They, they Every man, have, woman, and child. would have been dead, bro. You know, and we look at it and say, oh, God's such a mean God. Let me tell you something. We all deserve that. We all deserve to be annihilated. That's what sin brings. God is a just God who is holy, and He is righteous in His judgment upon sin and sinners, and we cannot fault Him for that. We cannot fault Him for that. We all deserve that. It's only by the grace of God we don't all get that. So, so excuse me just a minute. So, then... Are you saying that God decides whether what we've done is no. worthy? No, no, no. What I'm saying is what Bobby's question was, there are some people believe that Steph and I are Christian parents and we have a child. That child is saved by virtue of our salvation until that child gets old enough to make his own decision. That's a heretical teaching. God has provided the avenue by which every person of every age can experience the grace of God primarily baptism for little ones. Uh, and so God is desiring to save everyone, and He's provided the way for that to happen. People in the world today, many of them have rejected that because they've rejected Him for baptism. Okay? So, after seeing the conviction of faith exhibited in the life of the Apostle Paul and Silas, the Philippian jailer asked what he must do to be saved. This is, on, this is the only time this question is ever asked in the Bible. Does that? What must I do to be saved? It's the only time it's ever asked. <coughs> okay? The answer to the jailer is simple and to the point. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Then, what's the, next, what's the very next thing that happens? The jailer 
it's not in here, the jailer takes Paul and Silas to his home, washes and bandages their wounds because they've been beaten, then he and his entire family are baptized. Now, if he had children, they were baptized. If he didn't have children, there weren't any, even weren't any children baptized, but his entire family was baptized. Just like Lydia, when she was converted, her entire family was baptized. Okay? People say, well, in Acts, you have all these people being converted, they're all baptized, they're all adults. True. They were all adults, at least that we, for most of them, because there weren't any Christians. They were the first ones to get baptized. Everyone needed to be baptized. You know, you primarily have adults getting baptized in the New Testament because it's the first time they hear the gospel, and they're all coming to faith, and they're getting baptized. The few chance, the accounts we have, entire households are baptized. That means everybody in the house. Doesn't mean just some in the house, it means everybody. So we either accept the fact that Lydia, the Philippian jail, and some others had no children, or if they had children, they were baptized too. All right, so now we get to the names of God. Names of the Holy Spirit. This part will go pretty quick. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, okay, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water, right? Okay. Romans. You, however, are not of flesh, but in, uh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So He's called the Spirit of God. We're just showing these, these names. There's only a few names that we've got. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we have Spirit of God, then we have Holy Spirit. Not a different person, just a different way of calling Him. Like Jesus was called the Messiah, the Christ, Son of God. There are several terms we use to talk about Jesus. There are several terms we use to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now we'll ask the Father, and He'll give you another helper uh, to be with you forever. So helper or comforter. Okay. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the spirit of truth. What's interesting about this passage? Where is he hearing it from? The Father. The Father. Where did Jesus get his teachings? The Father. The words I speak to you are not my own. They've given me from above. Okay? Everything goes back to the Father. And I, and I still... I've got a book in my office somewhere on the shelf... You know, heard me. Some of you have heard me mention this before. It's it's called uh, well, and that one is called the Holy Spirit, the shy member of the Trinity. That book addresses the fact that in our world uh, and within you know Christendom today, if you want to be honest, you, you know, let's just talk about today. Who's the Father? Who's Jesus? He's the one that comes to us. He's the well. He's a gentle, tender compassionate, lambs in his arms, baby in his arms. Jesus is the one we know. Who's the Spirit? He is either ignored or it's charismatic. It's all about the Spirit. In the charismatic realm, we give lip service to Jesus and it's all about the Spirit and the manifestation of His gifts. In the non-charismatic world, it's all about Jesus and we give lip service to the Spirit and we've forgotten the Father. We never talk about the Father. But in reality, the Holy Spirit teaches us nothing except what he receives from the Father. Jesus taught us nothing but what he received from the Father. The Father sends the Son. Why? To accomplish our forgiveness. The Father sends the Spirit. Why? So we can believe in Jesus. What's the purpose? The Spirit comes to create faith in Jesus so we can be restored to the Father. The primary relationship we have with God is with the Father. It's not with Jesus. It's not with the Spirit. Everything is to bring us back to the Father because the Father loves us as His children. We were lost because of sin. And everything He's done is to bring us back to Him. It's about having God as our Father. That's why it, sh it shattered them and shook their mindset when Jesus said we pray our Father. God's not Father. God's like God. Jesus taught us Father. He taught us Abba. The, you know, he's like daddy. It's about a relationship with the father. Um, and we've lost that. In Christian today, father is distant, uncaring, unknowing. 
they even divide it. God, the Father is the God of the Old Testament, and Jesus is the loving God of the New Testament. No. Mark. I can tell you with certainty that if you think about how you see your father, almost without any any gap, that's how you see God the Father. Most people imagine God the Father based on their relationship with their earthly father. Exactly. If you see him... And that's a stereotype that for many people's lives we need to break. That's one that I had to overcome. I had a friend that confronted me at the age of 28. And it was... I, I never realized that how I saw God was because of how I saw my father. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, that changed everything. Right. A lot of, a lot, especially because ironically, you know this, that there is a unique relationship between fathers and daughters and mothers and sons. And there are many women who struggle with the understanding of the father because of the relationship they have with their earthly father. And a lot of women go to counseling about daddy issues and and they finally get a better grasp of who God the Father is as they go through counseling. It's, it's a real issue. It is. So, Romans. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the, of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. If you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So the spirit of adoption is another name used for the Holy Spirit. He's the one that created this new relationship. And you know the thing about adoptions in the legal realm today, at least in America, adoptions, if you are adopted, you become a full-fledged child of the parents with all the same rights and privileges as one born into the family, and they cannot discriminate against you because you're adopted. What does Jesus say? We're his brothers and sisters. Where are we going to sit? On the throne of God with Jesus. There's no discrimination. We are equal in standing before the Father as Jesus is, which blows my mind. It does. It blows my mind, but that's exactly what we're told. That, you know, He is still God and He's still Savior, but He elevates us to stand beside Him before the Father. Not behind Him, as inferior, but stand alongside of Him. That's an amazing thing. You have a question. I see it back there, Red. No? <laughs> Okay. Don't call her red. <laughs> well, you can call me other things, so we'll take red. <laughs> red what is the, red. What is the red. one red. sin that must... <laughs> yeah, I didn't spell right. What is the one sin that must be avoided and why? Okay. We always heard that sin against the Holy Spirit, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And what has that sin been identified as through, throughout history? Divorce. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. You give a divorce, you're going to hell. Alcoholism, if you're a drunk, you're going to hell. Suicide. Suicide. Definitely a sin against the Holy Spirit, you're going to hell. There's been, there's been all kinds of sins that the church has lifted up and said, this is, if, you, if you're guilty of this sin, you blast in the Holy Spirit. So suicide is not a... No. No. Absolutely not. There is no one sin we can do that will send us to hell. Because you do not go to hell because you're a sinner. You go to hell because you have no faith. Faith determines heaven or hell. And someone in a moment of confusion or anxiety, or whatever it is, could make a sinful choice to do something that doesn't deny faith. Okay? So, yeah. Well, we have a... Yeah. So, Mark 3.29... But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has never and never has forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. So, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject Him and His work, which is to reveal Jesus as your Savior, as the Savior of the world. What's the only sin that will send somebody to hell? To die with no faith. The Spirit's here for what purpose? 
to bring you to faith. To use the gospel to work faith in your heart, draw you to Christ so God can be your Father. That's the purpose of the Spirit in the world. And if you reject Him and His work, and you say, no, I don't want to be a Christian, and you die an unbeliever, you go to hell because you have no faith. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit because you rejected Him and His purpose for coming. It's no particular sin like drunkenness or stealing or anything else. It's to reject Christ as Savior, which is the purpose of why the Spirit's here. That's what sends somebody to hell. That's the only sin that's unforgivable, is to die an unbeliever. Uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you are, uh, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. To grieve the Spirit is to reject His working in your life, refusing to believe in Jesus. And that's the end of lesson one. See, I told you to get to lesson one. Now we move on to lesson two.